I'm just going to do a self-introduction. Hopefully you can hear me in the audience and also on Zoom. My name is Evan Villari. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm also an educator. I'm the director of the Center for Media Production at Johnson & Wales University, where I also serve as a full professor in the Media and Communication Studies program. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research that I've been working on for a project that just passed its six year anniversary. Uh, I recently uh, completed the film and it's worth noting that it's currently airing on Rhode Island PBS. Don't ask me when. Uh, check your local listings for details. Uh, and so the film is about the primary public water supply in the state of Rhode Island, um, the Situate Reservoir. And I had written for, a, I wrote for a grant in 2018 from Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. And it really just started off as like, is there something in here? Uh, I can remember hearing stories as a young person from my grandfather when we went wild blueberry picking within the protected watershed of the reservoir. My grandfather would point out there and he would say to five-year-old me, people used to live under there. And I was just like, what? What is happening? And so that always sort of stuck with me. And in addition to that, I was trying to, because I've been here, my people have been here for five generations, find some kind of direct connection to my family. As I think many of you that are interested in genealogy attempt to do, like helps answer the question of who I am, why am I here? And why do I keep returning back to the state? Um, in the, over the course of four years, I also received support, what we would refer to as finishing funds to complete the film from Rhode Island PBS. And it's always important to note my fiscal sponsor, the Center for Independent Documentary, who was very supportive in making sure that the film got completed. And so what I wanna do is I just wanna talk about how the film came to be. I'm gonna play what I refer to as the prologue, which sets the tone of the film. It gives you a sense of sort of my storytelling style and hopefully provides some information and some insight into the history and the documentation that I had to go through in order to tell this story. So here we go. The sky opens, runoff accumulates in several unnamed brooks in the northwestern parts of the state of Rhode Island. These waters flow into and form the Ponagansett Reservoir in the town of Gloucester and Swansicket Lake, a few miles east on the Johnston Situate border. From there, these headwaters continue on a southbound course, now as rivers, each carrying the names of their tributaries. The Maswansicut River is regulated at what is known as the Horseshoe Dam in North Situate before flowing onward under the Ashland Causeway and forming the distinct Y shape at the confluence of the Ponagansett to create the Situate Reservoir. A 100-year-old earthen dam then determines the water's fate. The unneeded excess falls over a spillway under Situate Avenue before joining the North Branch of the Patuxent River. The lucky H2O enters a gatehouse in the center of the dam before being conveyed through dual 60-inch steel pipes, which converge at the nearby filtration plant operated by Providence Water. Here, the water is aerated, treated with lime, coagulant, fluoride, and other chemicals before entering the delivery system through massive transmission aqueducts. A newer southern aqueduct travels through Kent County, Rhode Island, servicing three municipal water providers before meandering back towards the Providence Supply. The original aqueduct from the 1920s searches water underground for seven miles due east, utilizing gravity from the rise of the western hills in the city of Cranston, splitting off to supply sub-reservoirs and a network of feeder mains before crossing under the Bacasset River and joining a distribution system originally laid in 1870 under Reservoir Avenue. From there, a pair of 30-inch mains use gravity from Cranston's higher elevation to twist and turn to the taps of the homes and businesses of two-thirds of the state of Rhode Island. This is made possible through 12, 10, 8, and 6-inch mains that are linked to small service lines, many of which contain lead. 
So while I was conducting research, I was attempting to gather threads that I could interweave into a story. And in order to tell a story, you need access. Now, what I like as a researcher is I get to sort of set the parameters of the access. I can go to a library, I can go to a historical society, I can become a private collector myself. But in order to tell a story about a body of water, you need access to that body of water. And without going into the details, let's just say the public utility organization that oversees said body of water wasn't too happy with me poking my head around the woods of Situate. So I had to come up with alternative ways to tell stories. And so that just means I went down, 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 away from the reservoir into the distribution system. Now, not without trying to get too much into detail, I thought it would be appropriate, seeing that this talk is in Cranston, uh, to talk a little bit about the historical significance of where we are right now in relation to our water supply. So I don't know if anybody here is into cartography and map collecting, but does anybody know this category of map? Does anybody know what it is from 1870? Starts with a B. It's Beers, right? Okay, so we know. Um, so this is a, a, a roughly 1870s map, and I'm just going to zoom it in a little bit just to give us a little bit of context of where we are. We're here at the library. That's Sakonoset there. And our previous water supply, our being the city of Providence and surrounds, was right at the top of the hill. And that's the reason why Reservoir Avenue is called Reservoir Avenue. It used to be a dirt road. And so you can actually see there waterworks. And now, although my family has historically lived in Providence, I grew up in North Providence, my family and I, uh, my wife and three kids, now live in Cranston on Situate Avenue see where the interest in situate starts to come. And so we live here in a, an approximately 300 year old house. If you know where the Joy Homestead is on Situate Avenue, that's at the bottom of the hill. My house looks exactly like it on the same street, about five doors up, um, built in 1728. It is the Sheldon house. Um, and I bought it off of my kindergarten teacher because I've been in Rhode Island for over 40 years. There's only so many people who like history. Just to give you a little bit of context of why I was able to zip back and forth. And so my research brought me into the uh, civic engineer of the city of Providence back when we had one of those and back when those people had to be truly professional and certified. And if you've done any research into the infrastructure of Providence and Rhode Island, maybe even Connecticut, you perhaps have come across Shed's name. He came from Boston on down, and he's the one who put all the pipes in that we're still mostly using from Cranston into Providence and surrounds, as well as the uh, plumbing system, the sewage system as well, Shed. If you know this area, if you know where Tally's is, if you know where Aldi's is uh, right off of um, well, the name of the street is Pet uh, Petaconcept, but Pontiac Avenue over here, there used to be a pumping station. And so we would get water from the Pawtuxet River. This is 1870s, right? After all the dumping and waste had gone into the river, there were filtration plant, uh, there were filtration beds across the way, I'm told on the Warwick side, and then they would pump the, the filtered water to the pumping station and straight up the hill, to the top of Sock and Osset, and then from there, using gravity, would flow down into the city of Providence, but that was in the 1870s. And so this is just a little overview of that area as well. It's more or less where the sewage treatment plant is in the city of, uh, for the city of Cranston, uh, right over here. And so I think I three-dimensionalized this a bit. Yes, and then we're looking more or less due east, uh, due west, sorry, from uh, 95 there. And this is actually the other side of the Pawtuxet uh, River in 1905 when the filtration plant was completed. But what the residents and the decision makers in Providence soon realized was as the population was growing, we needed more water and we need fresher water because the water that we were pumping even after filtration was contaminated. And so when I start seeing 1905 and I go, oh, well, Giuseppe Valari, my great, great grandfather was here in 1892, goodness, he was drinking dirty water. So 
let's try to find a connection. And so that really was the impetus of the project. Let's try to connect my family to the history of the water supply, the past water supply, and then our current water supply. And then there's just the pipeline. If you know where Whole Foods is, if you were to go right behind Whole Foods, you can actually see that Providence Water still owns that land. That's the pipe that went from Petaconset up to the top of the hill. That was the Sakanasa Reservoir. This is what it looks like today. And you can see the streets have changed a little bit, but New London Avenue is there, Sakanasa is still there as well. And then Gravity on Down Reservoir. Now, Reservoir Avenue is still very significant in our water delivery system. There are still two 30-inch mains that exist underneath Reservoir Avenue, except the water supply is coming not from the top of Sakanasa Hill, it's coming from the Situate Reservoir. And there's a seven mile long aqueduct that starts in Situate. The first five or so miles are underground, cuts underneath Pippin Orchard Road. It cuts through what was formerly my backyard in Western Cranston. It divides right through Western Hills and Cranston West High School. It cuts underneath Park Avenue. It goes through Dean Estates, up, down, underneath Budlong, and then it connects over by, um, I think it's Garden Hills Nursery. So that's what we're looking at right here. And there's an intersection, if you look closely, I'll point to it. <sighs> aqueduct Road is so named because that's the road that you took to get to the aqueduct. Um, and it actually goes underneath, the water supply goes underneath the Pocasset River. That's just one way that water gets to uh, the city of Providence and surrounds. So uh, that's all the byproduct of research as I'm trying to like connect. Let's try to find B-I-L-L-A-R-I, -L -L my family's all important name there. So this is a map from 18, sorry, 96. And that's my house there. It was owned at this time by Albertus Colvin. Colvin's a very popular name, uh, not only in Cranston, but also in Situate. I'm sure you might have come across that. And you'll see to the immediate right of that is the uh, Andrew H. Sheldon estate. The Sheldons once owned hundreds of acres in Western Cranston, and it has since been divvied up. Uh, directly next door to my home in Cranston is what is referred to as the Aqueduct Reservoir. And this was something that was put in in the 1960s as a means to extend the shelf life of the Situate Reservoir. The Situate Reservoir was designed to last until 1970 with the increase in population. And so that's, if you, there was a, an article last week about uh, Big River. So if you know any stories about Big River, that was, we were supposed to join forces that was supposed to take us into the 21st century. But somebody came up with the idea, well, what if we just dig some giant holes and line it with concrete and fill those holes with water? Will we have a little bit of a reserve? Now, in that time, the water supply has only been tacked on to more and more, now including areas like Lincoln, anybody from uh, Kent County, so Warwick, West Warwick, Coventry, parts of Coventry. They are all wholesale customers of the Situate Reservoir of Providence Water. Your bill will say Kent County Water Authority, but they're buying it from Providence Water as a wholesale customer. And so they had to do that. So here's a little overview. Um, I was going to play, I'm just gonna skim through this just so you can see my house. Um, I'm not gonna play, this is actually from the film. Um, So this is, uh, my house is literally five miles in each direction from the Situate Reservoir and down City Providence. And how engineers usually measure is with round numbers. And so if you were to measure City Hall to the Gaynor Dam, which is like the center of the Situate Reservoir, it's 10 miles on the nose. And I am positioned five miles from the reservoir and five miles from down City, which is really convenient because I work down city at Johnson Wales University. So uh, here's just a little of my house and me walking through the house. I showcase um, my approach to research is if you're familiar with um, in performance method acting, you know, absorbing yourself in the characters. When I'm making a film, I convert rooms in my house to just labs of research and uh, this particular, what's my study, 
was decorated in the style of the early 20th century. So all the furniture in there, all the books in there were important. I wanted to be an engineer. If I couldn't talk to an engineer from Providence Water, I wanted to be an engineer from the era. And uh, this just showcases all the books about our water supply uh, that I've collected over the years. Um, oh, my map drawer, which I so adore of the era, and then pulling out maps that we've been looking at today. And so what I was, what I was struggling with was trying to make a connection to my people, right? So people with my last name specifically. And so uh, that really was the, the foundation of uh, the film and hopefully there's some relevance there. I wasn't able to find the people that I was looking for. That didn't mean they didn't exist, but as you know, if somebody didn't have a lot of money, if they didn't have the means to document their lives, um, coming from working class, it, there's no surprise that they almost are erased from history. And so it's important to me to try to find what I can. Um, and, you know, like research, and I'm sure you've been faced with this, we were talking when Ed was here, uh, that excitement, the, the, the journey, the, um, the discovery, right? But I think there's something to be said about the disappointment. You know that feeling when you see a name and you're like, all right, John Smith, and it's just like, I know it's that John Smith, but you just can't connect it. And you just have to tell people, just trust me. There's no documentation. Trust me. I know it's the same person. So I was struggling with that. And so as I was struggling with that, I started seeing some patterns. Um, and one of the biggest questions that I had as I was trying to answer why in situate was, who are the people making decisions about situate? And I was able to identify an individual who was the son of a wealthy landowner in Cranston. If you know where Sprague Mansion is, this is right by Sprague Mansion. Um, and I discovered somebody by the name of Potter, B. Thomas Potter. If there are any Potters around, I'd love to trade notes. And I was able to identify who his father was, Ferdinand Potter, who had a fairly successful commercial nursery. Um, it was based in Providence, but they lived out in Cranston. Here's a little catalog from Rhode Island Historical Society. And I was just like, well, who is this person? I had one photograph of B. Thomas Potter. He was a city councilman from Providence who was really signing off on all decisions related to what's re now referred to as the Situate Project. And so the tragedy of Situate is there were once five bustling communities in Situate that were forced out of their homes. Their communities were uprooted. They lost their jobs in order to create this public water supply for the greater good. There's nothing new there. This, this was happening all throughout the country at the time, but there was someone behind it and it was this Potter guy. And I was able to connect him through my research to at least 10 landowners in Situate who shared his surname and who were treated differently than people who were not connected to him. And what that means is people were able to continue to stay in their home. They were given um, higher value for their property. And I always found that to be quite curious to the point that I became really interested in this Potter person and what he did. So in addition to being a city councilor, he was the executive for a company called Providence Real Estate Improvement Company. If you've done any research in Cranston, uh, just about every development had the potter's hands on it. And they were given this property by their dad. And this property, then they just started gobbling up more and more area. Uh, so what we're looking at here is right next to what was formerly Narragansett Park. It's now called the stadium. That whole block from the corner of Reservoir and Park, pretty much all the way up to Twin Oaks, is all Potter development. In addition, they developed both sides of um, Reservoir Avenue. So pretty much everything that we're looking at here was a Providence Real Estate Improvement Company now, or, or property. Why is that important? Well, because the water supply comes from there. And so what I found very curious, if you've done any uh, research into the California water wars, if you've seen the film Chinatown, 
you know that there are people that historically, when they have inside information, they're going to gobble up a bunch of land to ensure that as the water passes through there, somebody's going to have to pay for it. And so I found that to be really, really curious. And that we're talking about large swaths of Cranston, all of uh, Knightsville. Um, so the the Italian immigrants from Etree, all those properties were Providence Real Estate Improvement Company. However, my family's not from Etree, so I wasn't able to make that connection there. And I was able to use resources like I have to I have to hand it to the city of Cranston and their uh, property records. Not only are they very organized and accurate, they're fully available online um, and you can get property cards. And uh, I wish more communities were able to put the time to put these uh, scans in. And what I really like as a filmmaker is that they used uniformity in all of their scans, meaning I can put all of these on top of each other and it almost looks like a flip book. So you just see the same constant of Providence Real Estate Improvement Company. And then through the years, it's all these different names. And so that was something that um, was really useful. So think about that. And this is just the uh, the property website, the tax, the tax EIS, uh, what G E E S, uh, and you click on the property, and it's just Providence Real Estate Improvement Company over and over and over and over again. Um, it's really quite wild. And so I refer to it as the California Water Wars on a much smaller scale here in Rhode Island, right? So very few people making these decisions, quote for the greater good. But really, if you saw the home that he retired in. 22 Fort Avenue in Patuxent Village, you know that he was doing okay as a result of all of that. And this is again from Cranston, this is the deed book from Cranston uh, Hall of Records, what's commonly referred to as the vault, if you've ever been in there. Um, it's just, this was shot with my iPhone. It's just page after page after page of Providence Real Estate Improvement Company through the years. It's really quite amazing. And it wasn't just Cranston, it was parts of Providence, parts of Johnston as well. And how they developed the properties, they were, it's, it's always very easy to identify on a map because they're tiny, not enough to put a house on. They wanted you to purchase at least two plots in order to put your house on. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of exploitation of particular immigrant populations, which I found um, quite interesting. And this is just 1896 when General Assembly and B. Thomas Parter and his brother put this into B, right? And it all started as a result of his father or their fathers, Potter and his brother Charles, giving them this initial plot of land and then taking it from there. And so uh, the film deals with this and there's a sequence in the film Byron Thomas Potter that I'm not going to play but I'm going to skim through that just shows the same documentation put in action. So the idea here is how do I take documents and then make it into a story? Well, I find things, I give them to an animator. I get curiosity when I find something close to my last name. And here's an example of like that flip book, right? They're all like, I just literally gave this to my animator and it's, you see, Cranston Highlands plot, Providence Real Estate Improvement Company. And the only things that are changing are the Italians, uh, their names through the years. Uh, and this is all um, Knightsville here. And you look at how tiny those plots are. It's not enough to put a, a house on. And what I did was I used this book. It's a great book called A Modern City uh, by William Kirk, uh, published, I think, 1909. And it's supposed to be sort of a, sociological governmental evaluation of the city and you know at the time the the language that is used to describe ethnic groups i mean they, they're just deplorable um and so i'm using voiceover to kind of like illustrate that i did find I, although i don't mention in the film on my mother's side uh, her maiden name is chipola uh cipola onion um if you look at the very, very, very top of the frame there, I believe it says Cipolla Laureate from Italy um, out of Naples. And so my mother's side's from Naples here. And so this is on, I believe, Pine Street uh, off of Atwell's Avenue. So I was able to make some connections uh, through the research there. And so um, 
Yeah. So that's a little bit. I uh, talk a little bit about uh, the other members of the Providence Water Supply Board and the film shifts and stops being about the chase to make a direct connection to a Valari that was living at the time. And it becomes more about the relationship between father and son. My son's in it uh, very early on. But really, if you were to watch the film, it's a film about my father and I. And my father is a easily frustrated, super retired. He retired very early, has been retired for a very long time, but he's my best friend as well. But we argue like crazy. And what's nice about uh, my relationship with my dad is, you know, as a retired letter carrier, he doesn't have much to give me, right? So he's a fourth generation person who's still working class, trying to figure things out, pay the mortgage, get it down. Um, and it wasn't until recently that he was able to like live the good life. Um, but it, the the sacrifice of father to son was something that became more of a, a thematic call for me. And so I was looking for instances in the film where people of privilege were providing that privilege directly to their children. And um, I came across the Grimwood name. Um, there aren't many mentions of Grimwood. There aren't many photographs of Grimwood, but he was also a member of the Providence Water Supply Board and a uh, city councilor from Providence, but he was a lumber dealer. And so I thought it was very strange that a real estate person and a lumber dealer were making deals out in situate. And so what the film suggests is that all the land that was getting cleared and was getting gobbled up and bought out wasn't simply for the land. It was to put to put the reservoir in, but what do you do with all that raw material? Well, you just sell it at your lumber yard. And um, I have the receipts, as the kids say these days, to prove that. Uh, Grimwood had a lumber yard on Westminster Street, where Ogie's now is at the intersection of Bridgham and uh, Westminster. And what I found was the Grimwoods actually owned property in Situate, and they purchased that property in 1913. The city of Providence decided in 1913 that Situate was going to be the location of the reservoir. They didn't have the approval at the state level to do so, but it made for a really nice summer home until it was taken over. And in the film, I actually go to the site of Henry A. Grimwood Jr.'s son's summer home and uh, the foundation is still there although it was taken by the city it was sold right back to um, the very board that Grimwood had worked on right so in 1914 this is just situate um, tax records you can see Grimwood Jr. there that's right behind the state police barracks and I found this lovely description of the Grimwood property from Rhode Island Historical Society there it is there. And so the point of this, and there's a house that I ultimately visited with my father in the film. The point of all of this is it's very non-traditional research based on personal identity and then not being discouraged when you can't find the things that you're looking for. Um, last night, I, uh, as I had mentioned, I had three kids. I've got twin girls that are seven. It was the first time they saw the film Young Frankenstein. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, 1974. There's this great line in Young Frankenstein, and I'm going to paraphrase here, where Gene Wilder's character says, you know, you know, one of the joys of being a scientist isn't just about the discovery, it's about the failures, and how do you, you, know, how do you handle failure as a researcher, as a scientist? It's with quiet dignity and grace. And then he goes, no, no. And so uh, I always find that if, like you, if you don't find what you were hoping for, even if the instinct is telling you, there's always something else. And in a small state like this, there's no shortage of making those connections. And uh, yeah, I want to end by showing maybe a montage of the devastation. Uh, I made a short, a very, very short film in 2020 that was sort of a proof of concept of the research that I had conducted until this time. And, mm -hmm. sorry, I discovered a letter from one of the homeowners in Situate, a woman by the name of uh, Sarah. And so I made this film, the short film, it's four minutes, I'm not gonna show it here, called Sarah's Story. And, 
it is comprised of letters from Sarah, who's trying to push back the city of Providence. You're not going to take my home. There's no point to this. You know, my whole identity is here. And she ultimately had to fall victim to the reality that if you did not have the means to do so, you could not protect yourself. And I think as ratepayers and as citizens, it's our duty to sort of investigate and push back, even maybe from a historical standpoint. It's not like we have, or at least not everybody is as fortunate as me where I have two wells and city water, but um, sometimes it's the difference between having water, clean water, no water at all. We should always question things. And so um, this is what Sarah's house looks like now. It's not underwater, but she was kicked out all the same. And this was something that had happened uh, for hundreds of homes in a very short period of time in order to create the reservoir. In my journey, I had been in touch with experts. There is a the de facto historian in situate. There's a guy by the name of Ray Wolf. Um, his books are probably here. Some of you might know him. He's in the film quite a bit. He's been a big supporter of my talks in the past and my research. And, you know, in my research, you know, just doing pre-interviews with them, he would always talk about the lives lost, like literally lost, the people that had committed suicide as a result of the condemnation of their land. And I was never able to find evidence of that. So it was always a nice sort of tale, urban legend that I would hear about, but was never able to actually find evidence. And I was editing the film. I had had to ask for extension after extension, years and months from um, the granting organizations that had provided me with money. And in a moment of desperation, I just went to Rhode Island State Archives, which was directly across from um, my office in Down City Providence. I was just like, I just have a couple of names and I just want to see what's there. And what I ended up doing was just going through all the situate uh, death records from 1913 to, I think, 1927. And I just went through and looked for suicides. And I was able to find seven suicides in this time. I was able to find names. As a result, I was able to then reconcile that with at least three mentions in the Providence Journal. And so those three suicides ultimately make it into the film. And one of these is um, an individual by the name of Red Sales Hill. Where is he? I want to just play that and then wrap it there. Where are you? Is that it? Nope. Sorry. So there were, there ended up being, uh, not only did people lose their lives, but uh, there were many cemeteries in the grounds that are now the Situate Reservoir and surrounds. And so they had to relocate the bodies. And if you've ever been out on 102 out that way, there's the New Rockland Cemetery, which is on the Situate Foster border. And so that New Rockland Cemetery was the home of the relocated bodies. And so uh, I made a short sequence about the New Rockland Cemetery that I hope to play. And then I'll wrap there. I had to move them all over here. So that's the voice of Ray Wolf, who gives a uh, bus tour no, that, of Situate. But farms had their own personal family cemetery. They had to take them and bring them over here because they were going to be under a reservoir. What they did was they made a map of the family plot. Dad's here, mom's here, Mary's here, John's there. When they come over here, dad's here, mom's here, Mary's here, John's there. So they put them back in the same order, which I thought was really, really great. 1,500 exhumed bodies were transplanted from family plots and community grave sites to the rolling landscape of the new Rockland Cemetery. Here is where many of the stories of the displaced are kept amongst the tombstones. They read the names of situate, past, and present. Hopkins, 
Browns, Bowen. These are just some of the families who tried to fight back and whose lack of political influence caused many of them to simply give up, like Fred Sales Hill. Mr. Hill owned considerable acreage containing a farmhouse and a few barns on either side of what is now the bypass of Plainfield Pike. Just as the reservoir was inching to full capacity and while his former farm was overtaken in the process, Fred Hill passed away on February 10th, 1926. He was laid to rest next to his parents who were relocated from the old Rockland Cemetery to the base of the hill in the new one. His official cause of death, suicide by cutting throat. So when the Wisconsin River comes down from North Central we have to blow right through here. And so that was a sequence from the film. Um, and, you know, I, I hate to celebrate tragedy, but in the absence of some sort of tragedy, in the world of filmmaking, it's just a retelling of something that had happened a long time ago. And so it was difficult for me to humanize this film. And I did that through research and making sure like every time somebody talks about a house, talks about a piece of property, they're not just stand-ins there, they're the actual location. So if I couldn't get a face of the person, I hopefully could at least get an image of their property. And as a result of another um, sequence that I had made about the Whitman family who owned massive acreage out in Situate, I was actually con contacted by Steve Whitman, who was a descendant of the Whitmans and was just like, I didn't know that story. And so they had done their own genealogy. And so I love the fact that had it not been for this public project and this research that, you know, he wouldn't have had that part of his identity. So that's my my failure in being able to connect the Valari line. I, I can't prove that there were workers that were building the reservoir that were direct descendants of me. I can have that feeling. I can have that John, which John Smith feeling, but I was able to, through my research, fill in some blanks for somebody else. And I think that's what one of the great things of the work that you all do. And so that is my talk. Thank you, everyone. Is this working? Is this working? Am I keeping this on? Okay. Sorry. Uh, it's not on the chat. Did yeah, they send it to you directly? Said, okay. Uh, is or will your having your film be? Um, someplace online or elsewhere. Yeah. Or sure. It's so the question was, is there a way to see the film in parts or in its entirety somewhere? You can check your local listings for um, PBS. It'll be airing for the next two years up through 2025. Uh, and actually, if you go to, it's hosted on the WGBH website, but if you search Blood and Watershed, you will see it online um, on PBS's website. It's a 71 minute long film. Very interesting story. I better not do Alan Church says thank you. No, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions from folks? Yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we were dealing with tech too. So uh, thank you for your patience. What do you got? Correct. Can I give you a mic so they can hear? Oh no, this oh this matter, right? So. Yeah. They did. There were like fourteen other options, yeah. Yeah, it was Providence Water Supply Board. It was originally the, yeah, anyway, yeah. They decided there, yeah. They took the land. It took a while, it took a few years. 
Um, but yeah, it did go to public vote. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. There were there were other ways to do it. So this is what I'm questioning. So why why was it there? Uh, so ultimately, the question was, let me get this straight. People used to get water from rivers. They got water from wells. And then all of a sudden, a group of men decided we need more water. We need fresh water. It needs to be outside of the contamination area, right? So all the factories that are dumping dumping contaminants along the river. Um, so why there and why not somewhere else uh, was ultimately the question. Well, that's what was driving me. Why there? And, you know, from my understanding, it's at the confluence of two rivers that were not exposed to industry. And what they needed to do is they needed to get that water to Reservoir Avenue because using gravity from Reservoir Avenue at, at Aqueduct Road, they could make sure that it would go into their existing customer's water supply using gravity, right? So the 30 inch to the 24 inch to the 12, to the 10, to the eight, to the six, to the tap. So they had to do that. Now there was someone who, there was an alternate plan to the situate plan. There were several, they had searched various areas. Um, a little north of what's now the situate reservoir in um, Hopkins Mill, you know where Hopkins Mill is, uh, north of there, like sort of like the Gloucester line. Shed, who I had mentioned, who was the civic engineer, came from Boston, devised a plan where the there would be a reservoir there at Hopkins Mill. It would impact two landowners. It would be a cleaner supply, and it would last not from 1970, not to 1970, but to 2020. That was his plan. And it got shot down. And I, uh, all I've read is correspondence of the Providence Journal of that. And there was going to be this whole, like, J. Herbert Shedd section in the film. Uh, you know, I was going to recreate the sound of, like, you know, men going fighting back and forth uh, in a court. And it was shut down. And, the, and I, it just didn't make sense to me. Like, why didn't it make sense? And, and the rebuttal was it would have been too expensive. It wouldn't have been gravity. And I'm like, well, if you look at the elevation and, and Gloucester and you know, watch it on down, just go right down Route 6. And you can, so the reason for it was because of the existing distribution system, the pipes. It had to get to, to reservoir, which was higher, and then tap. It would have had to have dug all the pipes up and then reroute all of that. It would have been too expensive. So... That was the reason why. Doesn't make sense to me. Why? Well, my my contention is there was already early influence from Potter because he knew people in the area. He knew like what he could get. Um, it is the right. I will say my research said you know despite the tragedy of people losing their homes, it was the right location. That took a really long time for me to come to terms with because it is at this confluence because. They could use a relatively short aqueduct of seven miles to get to the water. Um, but there were other plans. I like the shed plan better. I think it would have been worth it. Um, it would have only been two, two property owners, but the people who were making decisions had their own interests in mind and they had the ability to swing the votes. And that's what ended up happening. So that's the long-winded uh, version of that. They definitely put some thought into it. There were there were altern there were alternatives, but that was the one. But it still was only designed to last until 1970. Um, and there's a whole sequence in the film about the vulnerability of our uh, water supply and its storage as well. Yeah, it's very vulnerable. I mean, it's like the infrastructure is ancient. If you live in Providence or in parts of Cranston, you've got lead coming right to your door, and they know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyways, yeah, I mean, it's very vulnerable. Uh, it's it's concrete that's just like wearing out. It's just a matter of time before, and let's not even talk about extreme rain, and let's not talk about the flood of 2010, as I do in the film, but yeah, yeah, very vulnerable. Yeah, other questions? Sorry. Oh, Big River as well, right? So, so Big River was supposed to be the solution to take us into the 21st century, and so the same procedure it was uh, eminent domain, people forced out of their properties, and they were going to try to link the two systems in order to provide the entire state with fresh water, but they abandoned that project because 
we were able to identify an alternative, which was let's create these sub reservoirs, these underground reservoirs, including the one right next to my house. And so the difference is you can go into big river, like you can wander around. Nobody's going to give you a hard time because there's no water supply there, but in situate, you can't even discover um, anything. So, so people have wells, but also like Pawtucket has their own water supply system, you know? Um, so yeah. So two thirds. So it's Providence, Cranston, parts of Johnston, North Providence are the retail customers. And then Kent County Water Authority, all of Smithfield is now a wholesale, uh, Lincoln, et cetera. So if you add it all up, it's about two thirds of the state. 